let's see. Okay, guys, don't forget, there's about a 20-second delay by the time we say something and it reaches you. And I just want to praise the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that in his love for the church, he raises up men by his spirit to equip the church to proclaim the truth and refute falsehoods for the glory of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Son of God, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and faithfulness to us who do not deserve it. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding us to all truth and raising up men like James Knapp for the glory of Jesus. Have your way in this session. In Jesus' name. Folks, you know James Knapp. You know him. He's done two sessions for my YouTube channel, providing the historical textual data for the authenticity of Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, and the woman caught in adultery, John 7, 53, 8 to 11. And this kind gentleman was willing at the last minute's notice to agree to come Sunday, take time out of his busy schedule to refute some of the misinformation presented in a debate that took place on Friday on Explain Apologetics. If you go to the YouTube channel, Explain Apologetics, James White debated Pastor Jeff Riddle, and even by Jeff Riddle's admission, he is not an apologist, he's a pastor, and he's not a scholar of textual criticism. But even James White acknowledges, and his protege, Stephen Boyce, James Knapp is. The Lord Jesus has blessed this man. He's perhaps one of the most knowledgeable, if not the most knowledgeable among the evangelical Christians on the, the text of the New Testament. And I praise the Lord Jesus for him. So in this session, and I'm going to give you some links and I'm going to hand it over to him. But I just want you to know what the purpose of this session is. He's already given a talk on my YouTube channel on the authenticity of Mark 16 verses 9 to 20 on his own YouTube channel. If you go there, subscribe to it. He's now doing sessions on science of textual criticism. His last session was on Mark 16, 9 to 20. And on his YouTube channel, he has several sessions refuting even John MacArthur's misinformation about Mark 16, 9 to 20. John MacArthur. Now, here, he's going to focus on responding to James White's arguments. So when we open up for Q&A, Make sure your questions are, are about Mark 16, 9 to 20, and the objections raised by James White in that debate, because I won't take questions outside of the scope of the discussion. Now, let me give you some links before we begin, and I hand it over to him. This is the link to his <clears throat> website, his, his website where he posts regularly on issues of textual criticism, and he has several posts responding to James White, and refuting James White's egregious errors. Here's the link. Click on that link, and we'll put in the description box. You'll see some of the many posts where he highlights James White's blunders and errors. And I have to say this. I may sound like I'm coming out being harsh, but James White, though a brother, he does the same thing with other brothers and sisters in Christ. He'll go on the divine line and criticize them, and he doesn't think it's an attack. So I hope he doesn't take this as an attack. But the fact is... James White is not the scholar of textual criticism that he makes out to be. And he's made many mistakes that thank, thank God that people like James White have noted and corrected. So save that link and particularly this blog post. Because James White said something in that discussion that shows his inconsistency. What do I mean by inconsistency? He said we should not base our doctrine or theology on dubious passages and yet as james snap is going to discuss and in that post which i link to james white does that very thing makes a case for particular doctrines on dubious passages and also i want to thank our brother protestant believer he's working with james snap he's going to be posting the images that james snap sent so i want you guys to thank protestant believer pray for him Pray for his family. Pray for James Snap and his family because James Snap is not getting paid to do this. Neither is Protestant believer. They're both doing it out of their love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm indebted to both of them and the Lord Jesus bless them. And we love you and may the Lord reward you. Your reward is with the Lord Jesus. Now, with that said, my brother, I'm going to pull back, begin discussing and take it away. And hopefully the sound will be good. 
All right. Well, uh, while the uh, debate is still fresh in the minds of those who watched it with between uh, James White and, and Jeff Riddle, I'd like to uh, take a closer look at some of the claims made by, by uh, Dr. White. Um, about 10 minutes into the, the debate, uh, he mentioned that there are, are, are about five different endings, but I don't think anywhere in the debate he spells out in a coherent list exactly what five endings he's talking about. And there's a, a reason for that. Um, when I look at the evidence, I see uh, verses 9 through 20, which are supported by almost all manuscripts. The score, if we were to consider it a matter of scorekeeping, is, is three manuscripts uh, of, of Mark. Well, well, really, just two manuscripts of Mark and then one commentary manuscript that uh, end at Mark 16, verse 8. About six different manuscripts. Uh, one, one has... The, the usual text in, in the text and the, the shorter ending in the margin. But there are there are verses 9 through 20 in almost all the manuscripts. Uh, that's one ending. And there's the the shorter ending, which is in, in six man, Greek manuscripts. Uh, where are the uh, other manuscripts of the five? Um, and in, in his book, uh, the KJV Only Controversy, uh, Dr. White repeats some of the same materials that he presented in, in the debate. He says there were... But Mark 16, uh, 8 is the ending in some manuscripts of the Coptic Sahadic version. I think he means the Coptic Sahidic version. I think that's just a, a typo. And it's really not uh, gobs of manuscripts. That's, that's one Coptic Sahidic manuscript. Uh, it's a Sahidic Codex P. Paolo Ribs, uh, inverse number 182. Uh, you can just think of it as probably known to most people as that Coptic manuscript at Barcelona, Spain. Also, he mentioned manuscripts of the Armenian translation and some versions of the Georgian translation. Now, that's certainly true. There are hundreds of Armenian manuscripts that end at Mark 16, 8 in, in the Gospels. Uh, there are also some Armenian manuscripts in which the, the text of, of, of Mark is, is stretched out to fill space. So that when, the, when the manuscript was prepared, it was to include Mark 16, 9, 9 through 20. But the next person in line working on the manuscript stretched out the verses with, with uh, only up to verse 8. So there's clearly a controversy within the Armenian tradition about what to do with the ending of Mark. Now, if we look back into the 400s, uh, we see a witness that James White somehow neglected to mention, which is Esnik of Golb. And in Esnik of Golb's writing uh, Dedeo uh, against, against the sex, uh, he uses Mark 16, uh, verses 17 through 18. And that's an Armenian source from the 400s far earlier than any of the manuscripts themselves. But uh, more, more importantly, though, uh, the, the Georgian translation was translated from the Armenian translation. So when you're looking at the, the Georgian translation and you're looking at the Armenian translation in, in their, their early forms, uh, you're, you're seeing an echo of the Armenian translation when you're looking at the Georgian translation. There, there are long words that, that point in this direction. Uh, White also said, sometimes the passage is included and a number of manuscripts, along with critical marks, such as asterisk or obeli, indicating that the scribe knew of its questionable nature. Now, at this point, I think that, that White, like, like many other commentators, is simply uh, echoing what he was told by Bruce Metzger. And uh, Dan, Dan Wallace has made a, a similar claim. But uh, when you actually take a look at those manuscripts, uh, there are there is no such thing as a non-annotated manuscript that just has text critically relevant asterisk or obeli alongside Mark 16, 9 through 20. Uh, yeah, and, and we could take the time and go through those individual manuscripts that Wallace list and uh, see the evidence in front of you. Uh, some of this evidence is already presented uh, on my blog. He mentions a, a number of manuscripts. Well, really, that's the number of manuscripts that have notes, special notes between verse 8 and verse 9 or close to verse, verse 8. Uh, the uh, Family 1 manuscripts, those are fewer than 20 out of 1,600. Uh, and uh, th those are the notes that will say little, little things like, uh, in some copies, the gospel is completed here. But in Eusebius's canon list, he stopped at verse 8. And But, but then some will say, uh, like three of them, uh, in the ancient manuscripts, it's all there. Uh, somehow, uh, Dr. White neglected to mention that uh, manuscripts tw manuscript 20 and 300, for instance, say that, Mark 16, 9 through 20, is, is all there in the ancient manuscripts. Um, 
Also, the, uh, the Dr. White mentioned the uh, shorter ending is combined with the longer ending in a Codex L. And I think we have a picture of Codex L here we could look at. Could we see a Codex L? Codex L. No, nope, that's, that's, that's Codex K. It's a labeled Codex L. No, nope, yeah, 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 that, that's yeah this is labeled oh. L. Okay, well, maybe go one, 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 one. Uh... Okay, that, that was uh, Codex Cyprius. That 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 that, uh, that that L was for the order of the slot of the slides themselves. The, they go J H I J K L. They're in alphabetic order that way. So be labeled uh, Mark sixteen H Codex L. Yes, here we go. Yeah, this is Codex L, and if we could just maybe enlarge that a little bit, you can you can see here the shorter ending of Mark and uh, Mark sixteen nine through twenty. Here in the first page, there of the three pages, and th these are images from uh, the uh, the li Library of France. And um, there you see Mark Mark sixteen eight ends in that bottom of that first column, and then you have a little note at the top of the second column. Now, in some, this appears, and then you have the shorter ending, and then you have a note that says, "In some others, th th this this also appears after Ephabantogar." So the person that added the notes. Had had a had or was echoing a source that had um, copies of Mark that ended with a shorter ending, but other copies ended with the usual twelve verses, and that's what we see reflected here in Codex L, Codex L. Now Codex L itself is from the seven hundreds, so we see the shorter ending. But in all of the Greek manuscripts that have the shorter ending, all all six of them, we also have at least verse nine of the usual twelve verses. Now, if we had all the manuscripts in pristine condition, we'd have all 12 verses, but due to incidental damage, some of them don't, don't go all the way to the end of verse 20. And some of them, there's a little little, little scrap. Most of them are, are well, a good number of them are, are fragmentary, three, three of them. But uh, you can see the shorter ending, then there's a note, and then uh, the verses, verses 9 through 20. And on the, on the final column, you have the, 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 the closing title of Mark, uh, the, the Gospel of Mark. Then you have the beginning of the chapter the chapter list for the Gospel of Luke. That's what that's where the little though it's about this, it's about that uh, that little closing column underneath the little decoration there. So that's what we're looking at here in Codex L. Now those notes should not be overlooked. They're very significant because those notes are very similar to notes that are found in Sahidic Codex sixteen o two, and that shows where these manuscripts are from. It's not like Manuscripts have just popped up randomly that had the shorter ending. These all relate to a common geographical, a common transmissional line. And they, so they point us to a particular line. It's not like they're, they're popped up all over the place. When we look for those notes, we see the same note in the Sahidic lectionary. Now, it's possible that not uh, that, that not everybody that looked into this might, might, might grasp that from some things that Dr. White has written. In the, the uh, second edition of his uh, King James Only Commentary, when he's describing the shorter ending, he mentions that the uh, usual 12 verses are that, that the shorter ending is combined with the longer ending in L, in Psi, in 579, and then lowercase l, comma, 1602. Uh, that's basically a typo in Dr. White's book in the second edition. The L is not Old Latin Codex L. That L should be lectionary 1602 the, the, the comma shouldn't be there so that's lectionary 1602 but having lectionary 1602 share that feature uh, is important because it not only shares that feature but it also shares the notes when you look at the notes and, and, and codex l isn't the only manuscript that has these notes but that points to a common transmissional line that these manuscripts are connected to one another uh, dr white also says uh, what is more some old church Slavonic manuscripts from as far along as the 10th century include only verses 9 through 11 of the longer ending. Now, I'm not sure if he grasped this, but but he should. Uh, that's support for the longer ending. When, when it, it's like finding a hand of a skeleton somewhere. It's like you, you don't wonder, wow, how did this hand get here? No, it didn't crawl there by itself. There was obviously a, so, so somebody's arm, some, so, some human being was, was there along with it. So those old Slavonic manuscripts, uh, they're, they're damaged, but they're clearly uh, witnesses for verses 9 through 20. So up to this point, although although uh, Dr. White has 
listed the shorter ending in several different ways, he still only listed one ending. Now, Codex W, he says, adds an entire paragraph to the longer ending between verses 14 and 15. Yes, it is interesting that Codex W has that interpolation. And yet, still, this is one ending. It's verses 9 through 20. When you see the Freologion, you don't see it anywhere apart from verses 9 through 20. Verses 9 through 20 are still there. And here you can see, uh, uh, if you look at the yellow arrow on the left, on the, on the, the first page, that's where uh, Mark 16.9 begins. Well, you see the green arrows. Between the green arrows, that's where the Freologion is. Verses 9 through 20 are in the surrounding text. So it's not as if the Freologion is floating out there by itself as an independent ending, an independent text of some sort. Where it exists, it's always included within the longer ending, within verses 9 through 20. So it's an expanded form of verses 9 through 20, but it's not a different ending. I think Daniel Wallace, unfortunately, uses that same phrase to describe the Freologion as if it's a different ending. Uh, it's, ver it's an interpolation, but it's within the usual 12 verses. It's not a different ending. Uh, you, you could say there are different forms of the Gospel of Matthew, if you're going to say, well, wherever, the, wherever there's an, a, a variant, there's a different form of the text. Well, you, you could say that, but why would you? you you're just saying the obvious that's, that's true about any other text. So when we say that the Freologion is there, it's different in the sense that it's a different reading, but it's simply a different reading within the text. It's not a different ending. And by the way, when I say the Freologion, uh, it's not that this is more free than any other readings. Uh, uh, Charles Freer was the man who, who purchased the manuscript back in 1906. So, so the Freer Logion is simply an interpolation. Verses 9 through 20 are still supported. Now, uh, Bruce Metzger, in his uh, textual commentary, he kind of made a big deal of the Freer Logion being there. But uh, he, he, to, to him, the way Metzger looked at it, he believed that it could be the work of a second or third century scribe but not a scribe who is making spontaneously a, a different ending, as if so, this was something that would be continued from verse 8. The, the, as an interpolation, it's, if, if it's the work of a second or third century scribe, it's a second or third century scribe who had the surrounding verses already in his possession. So that's important to realize that when we're talking about the different endings, uh, about five different endings is, is how, how, how James White be, began the presentation. But so far... Uh, we've seen different descriptions of one ending. The, the short ending is the only ending after verse 8 that is an alternative ending. So when he refers to you know, the multiplicity of endings, it's one alternative to the usual 12 verses. There are not lots of alternative endings floating around out there. It's verses 9 through 20, and it's the shorter ending. Those are the two rival readings after verse eight. Now, uh, I think that uh, when you, so when you see phrases like all of these different endings, and when that is considered, this is the reason why Mark sixteen should not be there. This is the reason why this is the reason why I won't preach Mark sixteen nine through twenty. Um, well, let's uh, just uh, consider uh, him, his statement where he says you have to explain the existence of the shorter ending. And the use of asterisk and obelai in some manuscripts. Well, the use of asterisk and obelai, that can be explained. It's a phantom reference. Uh, there is no such thing as a non-annotated manuscript of Mark in which there are asterisk or obelai beside Mark 16, 9 through 20 that are text critically significant. Now, also, he says, you have to explain the long paragraph's inclusion in W. That is the, 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 the free logan. Why? That's a separate textual question. Verses 9 through 20 are there with or without the Freologion. And you also have to explain the manuscripts that put both endings together. Easily done. When he says all these different endings, well, one is there's no such thing, referring to the asterisk and Abelai. Referring to the, the, the notes, uh, those notes, that all those manuscripts still support Mark 16, 9 through 20 and have no alternative. The six manuscripts that have the shorter ending all also have verses 9 through 20. But let's look into that question of how do you explain the shorter ending? Well, this is how I would explain it, and it's not that complicated. But it involves the question of what is the original text? Because often you will see guys like uh, James White or, or Dan Wallace say, well, 
I want what the apostles wrote. I want what the original author wrote. And I'm thinking, is that really all we want when it comes to, for instance, the book of Deuteronomy? Uh, because Deuteronomy is, if you attribute Deuteronomy to Moses, what do you do with those last closing verses that describe the death of Moses? The, 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 do people think that Moses wrote about his death in advance? Uh, uh, when it comes to Joshua, same, same thing. Joshua's death is, is recorded. But also, what about the Psalms? Is it not completely obvious that the book of Psalms is a composite work with multiple authors involved, with redactors, with people bring bring new material to old material? And what about the book of Proverbs? Is it not obvious that Proverbs is a composite work? Do we not see the names of Lemuel and Agur specifically mentioned as, as authors of two chapters? If we just want the main author's work, your Bible will get a lot shorter, won't it? Likewise, in Jeremiah, in our Bibles, we have in chapter 51, thus uh, the, the words of Jeremiah end here, but you still have that final chapter, in which it looks a lot like something from First Kings, doesn't it? And yet it's there in the text. So the definitive trait to define the original text is not limited to who wrote it. The question is, was this there when the production stage ended and the transmission stage began? That is the technical definition of what is the original text, whether a work is the work of one author or whether it is a composite work. Now, if you picture a uh, Mark in the city of Rome helping out Peter. Now the early tradition said that Mark, Mark assisted Peter. He was he was his uh, his his helper, his secretary, and he collected Peter's recollections about Jesus. Now the church had been active in Rome for some time, and year after year they would celebrate Easter. Now you can picture Mark being urged by fellow Christians to make a definitive collection of Peter's recollections about Jesus. But uh, if there was a sudden emergency, let's say a, a persecution. Uh, about the time where, where, just before Peter himself was, was, was martyred in Rome, along with Paul. At that point, if you could in, indulge me a little bit, indulge your imaginations, if Mark hands over his unfinished account to his colleagues, not knowing what the future is going to hold, whether, not, not knowing whether he's going to be able to get back to it or not, but he gives it to his colleagues in Rome. As it turns out, he never gets back to them. They know that the book is not finished. And they know that the resurrection of Christ is an important aspect of the things that Peter taught. The reason why Mark is writing is to tell people this is what Peter taught. That's why we don't, for instance, see uh, virgin birth accounts in the, the Gospel of Mark. It's mostly things, not, not entirely, but mostly things where Peter is on the scene. Well, the co-workers of Mark don't want to publish his work in its manifestly unfinished form. At the same time, they don't want to add their own work. They don't want to make anything new to add to what Mark has written. So they take another composition of Mark, a brief Easter time composition relating to post-resurrection appearances, and add that to the main part of the text. And it's in that form, it's in that form that the Gospel of Mark goes forth. So verses 9 through 20, whatever internal objections people might be able to think up or imagine, that, 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 that's the form in which it goes forth. But somebody, either from somewhere on the way from, from Rome to Egypt, or somebody after the text is already in Egypt, says, wait a second, we regard the Gospel of Mark as the memoirs of, of St. Peter. We don't want anything that doesn't have Peter's you know, seal of approval on it. And so, it's not that they think that the, the work of Mark himself is, is bad, but they say, well, that's going to be set aside, so we'll have exclusively what we can say has Peter's approval on it. And thus, verses 9 through 20 are removed. And you might think, well, that, that would be a, a difficult step for, for a scribe to take. Well, look at the end of Sinaiticus, uh, the uh, ultraviolet slide of Codex Sinaiticus, I think we have somewhere. Yeah, th this is Codex Sinaiticus. Now, you won't see this at the website, but if you would have taken ultraviolet light and put it on Codex Sinaiticus at the end of John, you would see that the copyist deliberately initially left off that first that that, that 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 last verse verse 25 wrote his little decorative design wrote the closing title and that was that but then he changed his mind erased what he made before and wrote the final verse so you can see this tendency because where, where there's a a we where it doesn't sound like john they were averse to include it uh, 
some uh, I've, I've compared this uh, in, in some cases to the the uh, closing credits in Marvel movies. Um, you, know, you might see the end at the end of the movie, but you know there's more coming up. But the the uh, last twelve verses of, of Mark uh, were spread far and wide, and this is why the external evidence is so important to be aware of. Uh, sometimes this is unfortunately obscured by the vagueness of various footnotes. You will see footnotes that say in your Bibles, uh, some manuscripts have this passage, some manuscripts don't, or the oldest manuscripts don't have it. Well, the oldest manuscripts of Mark 16 are from the 300s. Um, we have lots of material that is older than that. It's simply not in Greek manuscripts. It's in Greek patristic writers. And if a Greek patristic writer's quotation or utilization of a passage is, is sufficiently clear, uh, that has enormous weight. The, the same way if that, that shows not only when, but where that passage was being used. So you can look at various uh, manuscripts and see that the Gospel of Mark was circulated with verses 9 through 20 in a very widespread area. For instance, if you look at uh, Codex Alexandrinus, I think we have Codex Alexandrinus up to, to show. Yes, this is, this is Codex Alexandrinus. It's at the British Library. And uh, you can see very clearly it's included there in the text. There's, there's no, uh, no, no note of doubt about it or anything like that. So that's Codex Alexandrinus from the 400s. Also, there's a Codex, Codex uh, Beze. Uh, this is Codex D. It has a very different form of the text throughout the Gospels and especially throughout the Book of Acts. But uh, there it has the ending of Mark. Uh, you can see it right beside that note in the margin. Uh, that, that note uh, means that uh, this was read on, on Ascension Day. But there is uh, Mark 16, 9 through 15. Now, the, ne the next page is lost. It's not extant, but the first part is, is there. So you can see it there in Codex Beze. Also in Codex C, now Codex C is a, a little, little different. It's, it's a palimpsest, but if you digitally, digitally remove the, the upper writing and leave the lower writing, the writing that's the older writing, before the manuscript was recycled, there you can see the text from Mark 16, 9 to 20, beginning on this page with, with verse 14. Also, in the Old Latin, some, some commentators claim that the, the Old Latin uh, doesn't have uh, Mark 16, 9 to 20, but you can plainly see if you look up uh, the Old Latin Fragmentus Sangalensis. This is a, a fragment, but the page before it uh, ha ha had, the, uh, it had the, the, uh, the usual 12 verses. We can see in the Old Latin Fragment Sangalensis, we, we see there the uh, the text it's a, a little bit damaged a little, little bit uh, stained but they they can see in the old latin it's right there and there's one manuscript that we're going to consider the abap babiensis which we'll take a closer look at later but also uh in gothic in the uh, the gothic version was translated by wolfius in the mid 300s and there's really only one substantial copy that's in pretty good condition well depending on how, how you say a good is but a Codex, Codex Argentius, a, a famous uh, purple manuscript in a deluxe format that's uh, hard, hard to read because the, doc, the, the parchment has become so, so dark relative to the text upon it. But in uh, uh, the Gothic Codex Argentius, we have verses 9 through 20. Now, for a long time, you can still read some books that will say it's only extant uh, up to a verse 11. But back in 1970, uh, man, uh, the city of Spire, uh, S.P.E. White... Y-E-R, uh, found in a reliquary uh, this the, the last page of the Gospel of Mark. So uh, so now, uh, no, up, update your books with a little note in the margin that says that. Now we have the whole thing. So that, that's the, the, the Gothic version that was made in about 3, 350, 360. Now the manuscript itself is, is later than that, but the version dates back to the same time as Sinaiticus. Also in Codex Delta, now a very interesting manuscript because it's so different from the format of other manuscripts. This, ha this has the, the Greek and the Latin uh, kind of kind of in, in, in interlinear. In Codex Delta, you can see uh, Mark 16, 9 through 20. And we've already seen uh, Codex L, also in a Codex Psi. Now, this is one of the few manuscripts that has the uh, shorter ending. If you see Codex Psi, I think we have that there. Yeah, can, can, can I just zoom in on that? You can see, see the, the shorter ending yeah, there. After verse 8, there's the shorter ending. And then it has, you can see, you can read the same note that you see in Codex L. That's because 
they're not just randomly popping up notes. These are coming from the same transmission line in the same place. These have a line of descent that's connected to lectionary 1602, which makes them connected to Egypt. And also, oh wait, go back a second. You, you, you can see in, in the margin there on the side, it says, no, that, that reading was to be used at the resurrection. This was one, one of the, uh, the, the readings to, to be used to celebrate the resurrection. So it's not like we're going to keep this but wonder about how to use it. Uh, this was definitely a text that was used in the church services. So if you look at Codex L and you look at the, 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 the note at the same place abo above verse 9, make that comparison and you, you can see the, 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 the note right there on the right. Yeah, and so forth. So those notes uh, point us to where particularly these readings came from that have the shorter, the shorter reading. They came from the same transmission line. And that explains why we see the, uh, the, the, this small, limited transmission line in Greek. In, as far as the Greek transmission is concerned, when verses 9 through 20 show up in that transmission line, the people that were circulating the shorter reading give way. They don't continue to circulate it because verses 9 through 20 are so dominant in all transmission lines at that point. We see the shorter ending being, being composed in Egypt during that brief period where the Gospel of Mark circulated without verses 9 through 20. In other words, the text arrives in Egypt or is, or is there in Egypt at some point early on. Uh, I'm thinking second century. And somebody's thinking, you know... I just can't stand it ending that way. And so somebody composes the shorter ending. Now, internally, it doesn't look like Mark's style. It doesn't look like you know, anything marking. And I think everybody recognizes that the, the shorter ending is, is not authentic. So, But they made it as a flourish to kind of just round off the text. In Codex Babiensis, in the old Latin Codex Babiensis, uh, which has to be the, the worst copied manuscript of, of any language, uh, the copyist didn't like how it contrasted with verse 8, so he just left out part of verse 8 before the shorter ending was, was attached to, to, to the rest of the verse. The Codex Babiensis is a, a very unusual manuscript, and, and uh, the scribe is not only uh, somewhat questionable in his readings, but not exactly competent in the things that he writes. He makes all kinds of, of basic mistakes. But also, you can see how dominant the, uh, short, the, long, the longer ending was in all kinds of manuscripts from different times, from different places. Uh, if we look at uh, GA 274, uh, Greg Allen, Allen to 274, we see one, one more copy of the uh, shorter ending, but it, it's not in the text, but it's there on the page in a GA 274. And uh, th this was a, a, a plate in Metzger's text of, the, text of the New Testament. It was also in a Williams uh, analysis back in 1914. But you can see... In the text there, I don't really have a pointer to point it out, but, but as the text concludes, verse 8, it says, this is the end of the second Heothena reading. And the little manuscript note says, no, this is the end of, this is the, the, the re referring to the lectionary stuff there, there on the right in the, in the margin. But then down there on the bottom of the page, if you look very, very closely beside the end of Mark 16.8 in the text, we can zoom in there. Yeah, yeah. You'll see an, an asterisk. Up, up in the text, up in the text. Yeah, right there in the left, you'll see one asterisk. Well, that refers the reader down to the margin. So in this manuscript, 274, the shorter ending isn't in the text. It's just meant, kind of mentioned as this, that we also saw this somewhere. So in 274, it's just kind of not, not so much accepted into the text as mentioned that we know it exists. And you see the short ending connected by asterisk, you, and you can go, go, go scroll on down, and you'll, you'll see the shorter ending uh, there in the text. Now, there are also variants in the, the shorter ending. So, I mean, if you, if you want to say, you know, oh, there are, there are five, there are six, there are seven, you, you, you could just rack that number up if you, you want to count individual variants, but it's not really a reasonable way to, to do it. Also, you can see in Codex Cyprius, which I think we, we, we saw before, in Codex Cyprius, this is an important medi medieval manuscript, uh, and it has Mark 16, uh, 9 through 20, and you can see it right there in the middle of the page. The uh, Anastasis begins on that one line. You can see the, see the initial on the left-hand side. Also, a Codex uh, Sidelianus. 
another manuscript. And uh, again, plan is day. It has verses 9 through 20. And then at the last column there, you can see the uh, the, the list of chapters for Codex, uh, for, for, for the Gospel of Luke. Then you have a Codex Campianus. Codex Campianus. It's a, a, a very well-made well made medieval manuscript. And uh, the, there again is the passage, plain as day. Uh, notice up there in the left-hand margin, you see the eoth in, in the margins. Part, part of it's been cut off. Sometimes sometimes ma manuscripts were, were rebound. And when they rebound the manuscript, sometimes they would trim the pages. And this manuscript's been trimmed just a little bit at the top there. And so it cut off part of the little abbreviation that refers to how this manuscript was read in the churches regularly as one of the 11 part series of readings from the ends of the gospels. Uh, that was a very, one, one of the ma major lectionary divisions in, in the lectionary. And that little note up there says, this is the third Eothion or Eothina uh, reading. So, so we see it being used in the church as well as being used in the manuscripts. And also in some manuscripts, by the way, you might've noticed that there'll, there'll be a little margin that says, don't just begin reading this by saying, when Jesus rose, they'll begin with the thing, when, when he arose on the first day of the week, but when Jesus arose on the first day of the week. Sometimes uh, it's not rare to see a little note that says, when you read this in church, use the name Jesus in that first uh, opening sentence. Also, uh, Codex Macedonianus. And now this was discovered uh, after Westcott and Hort. Uh, Macedonianus also has verses 9 through 20. You can see... Uh, if you zoom on it right there, there's the, the end of verse 8, and you can see the, the initial A, uh, beginning of verse 9. Also, uh, if you look at uh, GA113, if we see GA113, this is a relatively early minuscule manuscript. You can see the letter, lettering is, is different, but it's all clearly right there, and along with the, uh, the notes at the top that explain how, how to introduce the, the reading. And you also see a, another reference to it being the, the third reading in that, in that series of lections. Also in um, GA 485, we see verse 16, ch chapter 16, verse 9, there the uh, very, very first line of the page. Also we can see a uh, GA 504. And if we wanted to keep going, you could just see, no, you, you could spend hours looking at manuscripts and in manuscript after manuscript after manuscript, over 1,600 of them, you'd see Mark 16, 9 through 20. So uh, as far as the, the range of those readings, it did not just dominate in the, the medieval manuscripts, but also in early patristic reverence. I think, I think that the Dr. White at one point made a reference to, well, if only we had, oh, 10, ten first-century manuscripts then to be more, more more persuasive. Well, when it comes to the early patristic writers, we can see um, uh, early work. That this wasn't mentioned in the debate, but uh, in addition to Justin and Hatian and Irenaeus, who were mentioned in the debates, uh, there's another work called the Epistula Apostolorum. And it's a, a more nuanced argument needs to be made to see what's going on with Epistula Apostolorum. But uh, Robert, Robert Stein made a, made a good argument for it, and so have some of the some of these uh, scholars that are that are closer to this composition than, than your average scholar have said, yes, it definitely looks like the uh, Epistle Apostolum's author was familiar with uh, Mark 16, 9 through 20. So I would say there's not just three for second century uh, patristic writers supporting Mark 16, 9 through 20. There are four, at least four. Now, it's difficult to say that there are more than that because once you get more than that, once you, once you get earlier, say, with, with Hermas and Barnabas, a person could say, well, that looks like a reference to Mark 69 to 20, but then somebody else could say, well, but how do we know that the person that wrote Mark 69 to 20 wasn't borrowing from Hermes? So there's so there's a, a, a degree of, no, it's 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 so close we can't trust it at that point. But uh, but there is evidence from from from, uh, from from Barnabas and from Hermes that should be considered. I think a Nicholas Lunn, who has written a, a very detailed book uh, about the ending of Mark, would go, go goes into detail about those witnesses. But besides Justin Martyr in First Apology chapter forty-five, and I'd say First Apology chapter fifty, uh, Justin Martyr you know, appears to use uh, Mark sixteen twenty. Now Hort back in eighteen eighty-one, he said, "Well, I'm not so sure because what Justin is saying doesn't really 
point directly to the point that, that he's making about that being from Jerusalem. But then in 1888, after Hort had written that that uh, no question mark, then came out the uh, the Arabic Diatessaron in a form that was more accessible, uh, si Siaska's edition. And once that came out, Harris, uh, J. Randall Harris, and, and Frederick Chase both said, well, when we look at the Arabic Diatessaron, we can see that there's a connection being made. There goes Hort's objection. Uh, now, Metzger, when he made his commentary, his own textual commentary, um, uh, th th this book here, uh, Metzger seems to have been following uh, Hort rather closely when he wrote this part of his textual commentary. You can see, if you do a comparison between Metzger and Hort, how every now and then Metzger will just repeat a phrase that Hort used, because uh, Hort's, excuse me, Metzger is closely you know, re repeating some things that, that Hort said. But uh, Hort's objection vanished in 1888. It's just that some scholars today are still noticing what Metzger said, but not noticing what Harris and Chase said about Justin. Uh, you can also go to a Tertullian, Hippolytus, the, the, the Dascalia, to Vincent of Hithiverus at the Church Council, uh, Seventh Council of Carthage in 256, the composition called De, Rep De Re Re Reptis Mate, also the CY form of the old Latin chapter summaries. And now these have come into play recently in discussions about uh, the, the story of the woman caught in adultery, John, John 7, 53 through 8, 11. And uh, in the CY form of the Old Latin chapter summaries, here we have chapter summaries translated that, 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 that echo the form of the text that was being used by the Old Latin text. And we see there is a Latin chapter summary that mentions the events in Mark 16, 9 through 20. So there is yet another witness that's supporting the inclusion of Mark 16, 9 through 20. Also, there's the writer named Hierocles or Heracles. Now, Hierocles is an interesting witness because he's not a Christian. He's a student of, of Porphyry. And Hierocles is make, wrote, wrote this composition called Truth Loving Words. Uh, but he recycled some materials that Porphyry had used. Uh, some, some other writers at the time say, yeah, Porphyry, he repeated some things, things that, that, excuse me, I got it backwards. Uh, Hierocles, he would constantly repeated not, not just the ideas, but also the very words of his teacher, Por Porphyry. And we see uh, the writer Macarius Magnes in about the year 405 uh, responding to a book that appears to be the same book by Hierocles. Well, that's around 305, so we're still, by this point, the, uh, the witnesses I've described so far uh, are all earlier than Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. If, if, if Hierocles is the writer, he makes this challenge to Christians. He kind of makes this jive. He say, hey, Christians, if you're, if you're so sure about the things that Jesus has said, then when it comes time to uh, appoint a new priest or a new, a new uh, presider, uh, why don't you have a poison drinking contest? So that, that's the kind of thing that, that uh, Hier Hierocles and Por Porphyry did. But we can see that it was in the text they used. Also, Afrahat. Um, we see uh, in James White's book and in his, uh, in his debate, he mentioned the Sinaitic Syriac, uh, but he didn't mention Afrahat, did he? Uh, Afrahat is way earlier than the Sinaitic Syriac man manuscript. And uh, Afrahat, in the year 336, uh, quotes from Mark 16, 9 through 20, in uh, his first demonstration. And that's in Syriac. So we're not just talking about Greek, not just Old Latin, not just Gothic, but also in Syriac, we see support for verses 9 through 20. And then there's the Furologion, which Metzger considered the work of a second or a third century scribe. So there again, there's somebody that has verses 9 through 20. Also, there's a newly discovered writer named Fortunatianus. You won't see this mentioned in a lot of commentators because uh, Lu Lucas uh, Dorfbauer, I think that's his name, um, just recently uh, did, did, did the work uh, on Fortunatianus. And Fortunatian says that uh, Mark shows that Jesus you know, ascended up to heaven. Where do we see Mark mention that? In Mark 16, 19. Also, Augustine uses Mark 16, 19, 20 from his Latin text. But not only is it in his Latin text that he's using. Now, of course, uh, he knew Jerome and Jerome had, had the Vulgate. But also, Augustine at one point, uh, as he's commenting on the Gospel of Mark, as he's talking about his uh, make, making a harmony of the Gospels, he mentions his Greek manuscripts, and he quotes what his Greek manuscripts say in Mark 16, 12. Well, that implies the presence of the rest of the passage. So Augustine and Augustine's Greek manuscripts use it, 
And Augustine's also using the manuscript in church. So there in North Africa, it's it's not not in doubt even a little. Also in what's called the, the Lucian Acts, in what's called the story of John, the son of Zebedee, it's, uh, we see it being used, but, and this is re referring to these, the scope of where, how, how far did this go? Uh, e even, the, even the unbelievers, the, the pagans, like Hi Hierocles, use it. Even the uh, non-Orthodox writer of Lucian Acts uses it. Macarius Magnes definitely had it in his manuscripts in the year 405. We see it being referenced in the doctrine of Adai. We see the uh, writer Pelagius use it. We see Philostorgius use it. And I've already mentioned Esnick of Gold. Now I'm, I'm just heading into the, the 400s by this point. We see Prosper of Aquitaine use it. Macarius Mercator uses it. Marcus Aramita uses it. Now, 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 so, so now this is an important thing. that when, you, when you look into these names, you can appreciate more of the, the geographical range that this reading had throughout the church. Prosper uses it over here. Marcus Aramita uses it over here. St. Patrick uses it. In Ireland, Nestorius, as cited by Cyril of Alexandria, uses it. And in Ravenna, Italy, Peter Chrysologus used it and, and wrote extensively about it. So that's 32 patristic writers from the time of the Roman Empire. What more do you need to see that this was a, a, a text that was being used widely by the church, except in that little area in Egypt where it had been either removed are accidentally lost. I, th I think it was actually actually removed. But we can also look at, to, to, to give a, a better idea of the range, the Curatonian Syriac is, no, there's hardly anything to Mark of the Curatonian Syriac, but what there is in Mark has Mark 16, 17. There's also, over in Britain, the life of St. Samson of Dole. That records an, an event that involves a, a recollection of Mark 16, 17 through 18. Also, the Old Latin VL number eight, uh, Codex Corbiensis uh, two. Uh, also in Ar Armenian and in, in uh, Old Georgian, uh, earlier than the manuscripts, we have a text called the Martyrdom of Saint Eustathius of Mazikekta. Yeah, just like that. And uh, that the author of that kind of and, and, and it's it's not an exact quote, but you can see that the author of that text is aware of Mark sixteen nine to twenty. There's also a text called the Revelation of the Magi, uh, not w very well circulated, but it clearly uses Mark 16, 9 to 20, or at least material from within Mark, Mark 16, 9 to 20. There's even a Nubian, Nubian, we don't have very much Nubian at all, but what we do have includes a Nubian prologue to a hymn. And in Coptic, there is a Coptic homily on the Domitian of Mary attributed to Cyril of Jerusalem that also uses it. And finally, in Old Dongola in what is now Sudan, there's a wall inscription that features the ending of Mark, Mark 16, verse 20. So that should give you some idea of the scope and the range of how much this was used in the church. I don't know uh, if, 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 if all these texts were just, if we didn't know of all this yesterday and we suddenly learned of them today, would there be any doubt? So when, when Dr. White uh, says there's an inordinate number of variants to be found within those 12 verses, especially in the earlier witnesses. Does he have any evidence to support that? Because when I look into Swanson's uh, horizontal line record of, of, of variants, it's, it's, it's a, a lot more detailed than the Nestle, Nestle Allen uh, apparatus by, by far. Uh, when I look into Swanson's line-by-line -line comparison of readings uh, for Mark 16 and 20, and this was just a, a casual looking, I might, I might be off by a few, but I found uh, 77 variants. When I looked in Luke 24, verses 42 through 53, another 12 verse section, I found 78. So I th kind of suspect that Dr. White might have read that claim in a commentary by, by Richard France and believed it. But uh, actually, I kind of suspect that Richard France might have been thinking about the story of the woman caught in adultery and wrote it about Mark 16 to 20, and nobody caught the mistake. Uh, Dr. White also says around the 16th minute of the lecture, open columns were left in Vaticanus, in other places. And uh, th this is just a little bit of subterfuge that uh, is, is used to refer to the blank space in the Old Testament section of Codex Vaticanus. The idea is to say, when you see Codex Beze, excuse me, when you see Codex, Codex uh, B, uh, do, we, do we have the uh, page of Codex B, Codex Vaticanus, that shows that the way it exist and the way it, it can be reconstructed. So I say, yeah, there we go. 
Uh, there on the top, you can see Codex Vaticanus as it is. It has this blank space after Mark 16.8. Now, this is one of the, one of the two manuscripts that don't, one of the two manuscripts of Mark that don't have verses 9 to 20. We see the text end, and then there's this blank space. Well, within that blank space, you can fit verses 9 through 20. There it is right there in front of you. And uh, to make this reconstructed text, I used letters from elsewhere on the page and put them in there. The lettering is slightly compressed, but copyists knew how to compress the lettering. If you look in, in Codex Sinaiticus, uh, at the being opening pages of Mark, where there's a where they were excuse me at the, at the opening pages of, of, of Luke along, along with the end of Mark, where there is a replacement page, you can see that the copyist knew how to compress the lettering much more drastic than the text text on on this page. So there is Vaticanus. It has a blank space, but the blank space is sufficient for the ending of Mark. So who are you going to believe? Uh, some commentator or your own eyes? So th there's a claim that open columns were left. I, mean, I kind of got distracted on that. Open columns were left in the Old Testament, but contrary to what Dan Wallace, for whatever reason, claims in his perspectives chapter, uh, he, he, he says, you know, well, it's really tough to see what caused the, 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 these blank columns. Well, in real life, it's not hard to see. Uh, it's not hard to see at all. You can see that the page, the, the, the blank space between Second Ezra and Psalms in Vaticanus occurs because the format of the page changes. The text in Second Esdras is written in three columns per page, like most of Vaticanus, but the text in Psalms is written in two columns per page. So where the format changes, you're going to almost inevitably have some space le left over. Also, the blank space between Tobit and Hosea occurs because at this point, one copyist work ends and the other copyist work ends. That's not hard to explain. It's simply leftover space. And the blank space after Daniel occurs, well, that's the end of the Old Testament portion. There's simply no more Old Testament to write, and it would be remarkable to start the Gospel of Matthew with anything other than a fresh folio. So these are not some mystery about why they did these things, and nobody should say so. Uh, I, I hope that claim of Wallace is, is retracted if they make another edition of that book. So, uh, so also the the uh, so the idea first is is wrong. The, the claim that the blank column wouldn't be enough for verses nine to twenty. Uh, well, they well, they see it. Oh, you could you could stretch out the letters a little bit more than this you can also uh, compress them a little bit more than this but the idea of making memorial space which is what we see there, there at Vaticanus at the end of Mark the idea of memorial space wasn't to make an exact fit uh, it was just to leave enough space to convey that the, the copyist recollected something that was not in his exemplar it didn't need to be an exact fit we see in Codex L and we see in Codex Delta blank spaces are left for the story of the woman caught in adultery they're just recollecting something's missing in my exemplar, they're not trying to you know, calculate to the line exactly how much space they, they, they would be required. So uh, so, we, so I think, I think those, those were some of the, the, the main uh, things that need to be clarified from the things that, that Dr. White said in, in the uh, debate. But mainly there's that claim that over and over, I think this was his entire case. We, you, I think we saw him uh, kind, kind of stall for quite a bit of the debate and not really talk about Mark 69 to 20. It was more, more focused in anticipation of the, the uh, ecclesiastical bibliology view. But repeatedly, he says, multiple other endings exist. I remind you, you have the abrupt ending at, at the end of verse 8, you have the shorter ending, and you have the usual 12 verses. That's three endings. Uh, so even though he says, you know, the multiple other endings exist. Now, what, what, watch how the, the, the rhetoric is designed to work in, verse, in, in the 16th minute of, of the debate. The multiple other endings that exist. Why would you have multiple endings? Why don't we have multiple endings in John? And then verse 20, and uh, the 23rd minute, other endings are mentioned again. Other endings again, and again. And then in the 27th and 58th minute, a multiple other endings. Why are there multiple endings? So the, the multiple endings is a, a, a facade. There's really only one ending written after Mark 16.8, that was the shorter ending that was limited to Egypt and also spread to the versions that, that kind, kind of trickled down, the, the Ethiopic and the Boharic. But uh, as far as the Greek evidence is concerned, the shorter ending uh, is confined to that particular line. And we can see that clearly by looking at the notes that accompany it in Codex L, Codex Psi, and some of the, some of the other uh, manuscripts that have it. So that should be... Uh, 
very clearly, uh, when you take away the objection, uh, what about the multiple endings? Well, there aren't multiple endings. There's there's one alternative ending. Uh, so re really, that that objection uh, doesn't really hold anything. It simply says, what happened in Egypt? Well, when Mark 16, 9 to 20 was lost, somebody made up that short ending to round off the text. But when Mark 16, 9 to 20 was restored, as we see it, you know, never was lost in all these other places, so some of which I just listed and could keep on going. When it was finally restored from all these other places, they stopped they, 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 they stopped circulating the text with just the shorter ending. We don't have a single Greek New Testament manuscript where there's just the shorter ending because they realized what people need to realize today, which is that Mark 16, 9 to 20 was part of the original text. And uh, Sam, if you have any questions. Okay, this is where I want to help the people understand. First of all, again, guys, here's where I'm going to need you to listen because I'm going to ask them questions to help you understand. But before I do that, I want you to, again, praise the Lord Jesus Christ for Protestant believer, my mod, helping James Knapp post these images to show you the material. Protestant has been a great blessing to our ministry, and it's his ministry too. He's the one who beatifies my YouTube page when he has time because he has commitments, family, and work. So pray for him and thank him. And thank James Snap for being a breath of fresh air, for loving the Lord Jesus enough to present all the facts, even though it, it goes against the grain of academia, which is why many of the so-called textual critics are not fond of him and won't debate him. And if you don't believe me, you think I'm hyping him up, Okay, several weeks ago on Explain Apologetics, go there, Explain Apologetics on YouTube. There, James White and one of his protégés, I call him, because he seemed like he really admired James White. Let me be gracious. Stephen Boyce, who were doing a presentation against the TR position. James White was asked, and it's recorded, will you debate James Snap? Will you debate James Snap? You know what he said? He said, I'll debate him on John 6 on soteriology. He refused to accept the debate challenge to debate James Snap on issues like Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, and John 7, verses 53, 8 to 11. It's there recorded. Now say, James White, the ball is in your hand. This man is correcting your errors. You need to have a discussion because these errors to the uninformed can mislead them. And you have a responsibility before the Lord Jesus Christ and his church. Now, I'm going to ask questions to help them because a lot of this stuff goes over people's head, my my my, my own head included because I'm, I'm learning. I'm a neophyte. First of all, so we can set the records uh, straight, Brother James, I just want everyone to know you're not King James only. You're not TR, Texas Receptus only, or Majority Text, just so people don't think, oh, another King James nut, correct? That is correct. So you're not King James only. To you, it's not the perfect words in English. I am not King James only. I am not a Byzantine prioritist. No. The answer okay. to your question is no. In case so you got it, right? So I don't want people to try to attack the man ad hominem or genetic fallacy by saying, oh, he's one of these King James only nuts, and he wants it to be true. So that's number one. Number two, so people understand, how many copies – of Mark do we have that have Mark 16? Not the longer ending. I'm just talking about all the copies, approximately, how many would have Mark 16 with or without the longer ending? I don't think anybody's got an exact count. And if they gave you an exact count today, it'd be obsolete in a couple of years. Right. But somewhere, I think around 1,640 is my, my, my best estimate. I haven't seen any estimates closer than that. Okay, so approximately 1,640 guys. Out of the 1,640, how many have the longer ending, percentage-wise, if you want to go with percentage? Well, only three don't, so no, 1,640 minus three. Wow. Guys, did you hear it? I want you to be blown away. Out of approximately 1,640 copies of Mark 16, 1,637 have the longer ending. Did you catch it? Only three don't have it. Okay, put that in mind. But what, what, one of those, Good. What, one of those three is is a manuscript three hundred four from like the eleven hundreds or so, and its title isn't the Gospel of Mark. Its title is the Interpretations of the Gospel of Mark. It's it's a 
It's a commentary manuscript, made, made mainly for the sake of the commentary, but it has the text of Mark interspersed. Uh, wherever there's a section of commentary, then there's a section of Mark, then there's a section of commentary, then there's a section of, section of Mark. It ends very unusually uh, without a closing title like most manuscripts of Mark would have. Okay. But but, uh, but technically, you'd have to say, well, it, it technically, it, it is a manuscript of some sort, and it doesn't have Mark 69 to 20, but it's a very, very late manuscript, and uh, it's it's not particularly important. The only, the only really important ones are Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Now, you see that people are shocked because they're not told this. They're not given this information, which brings me to my second question. What is the oldest reference? Guys, pay attention to my question, because we know we don't really have many early copies of Mark, and if we do, they don't have Mark 16. But what is the oldest reference to the longer ending of Mark 16, 9 and 20? The oldest reference we have showing that the longer ending existed from that period. The oldest patristic reference where the author specifically cites Mark and says, I'm quoting from Mark here, is Irenaeus, writing in the third book of his composition Against Heresies. And so that's from about the year 180. So now, just so people understand the importance, Irenaeus, the bishop of France, and it says that he was a disciple of Polycarp. And we know Polycarp was an apostle of John. So I want people to understand. Irenaeus in France, the bishop of Lyons, France, who got martyred. Around 180, says Mark wrote, and he quotes Mark 16, I believe, was it 17? For 17? Uh, Mark 16, 19. In, in fact, in Codex uh, 1582 and, and in Codex uh, 72, their copies uh, are, are somebody that had them at some point even added a little note in the margin in Greek that said, you know, Irenaeus in his third book of Against Heresies, Irenaeus, who lived close to the apostles, quotes this in the third book of Against Heresies, and it's right there beside Mark 16, 19 in those two, in those two manuscripts. Okay, one more time. I want, see, I, I want them to be blown away because you see the reaction. They're getting blown away. Not only does Irenaeus cite it in one, around 180 AD, Mark 16, 19, it says Mark wrote this. You said there are two copies. Can you give us the dates of those two copies? Uh, 1582 is, uh, I think, from the year 989, maybe. Uh, but uh, but it's it's more important than, the, than the, the actual composition date because it's echoing an older exemplar from the Family One group. And the Family One group would be roughly, their exemplar would be how? Well, well, family One probably dates back to the 400s. 400s. So you have a copy that's based on an exemplar from the 400s and in the in the sign note it says Irenaeus who is closer to the apostles quotes mark 16 19 so that here you have a later copy of saying this was cited by Irenaeus who is closer to the apostles and therefore by mentioning that that's basically the copious way of saying it's genuine am i wrong no, you, you, I think you're correct, but uh, but also uh, uh, 1582 is part of Family One, and Family One is the group that has the note between verses, verse 8 and verse 9 that says, you know, this is not in all the copies, and in some copies, excuse me, this is not in all copies, and in Eusebius' canons, he, he finished his canons at the end of verse 8, but in many copies, this also appears, and this is the reference to uh, verses 9 to 20. So that, that, that uh, format in general reflects a context where they knew there was a question about it, but that note about Irenaeus would kind of answer that question for them. Okay. So to piggyback off of the earliest extent <clears throat> reference to Mark, as far as copies of Mark, how old are the oldest copies of Mark, irrespective of whether they have 16 or, or not? I mean, let's say from the 2nd century, 3rd century, and 4th century. 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century. Would you know roughly how many copies of Mark we have? Well, we have no copies from the 200s of Mark 16. Well, we have Papyrus, Papyrus 45, but it's not extant from chapter 16 at all, from, not, not from any part of the chapter. Now, okay. Codex Vaticanus from about the year 325 ends at verse 8. Sinaiticus from about the year 350 in Caesarea. Uh, now that, that's uh, my, my, my uh, best guess at where, where it was made. Uh, Codex Sinaiticus also, also ends at verse 8. But we see uh, in, in Sinaiticus... The pages that have the end of Mark and the first and the first four columns of Luke, uh, those are replacement pages. Those were not made by the same copyist who made the text before and after that uh, cancels that th th those pages of Mark from, from Mark fifteen, excuse me, from, from Mark fourteen fifty four through through sixteen eight, 
and also in Luke from verse 1 to verse 56, those were made by somebody else who didn't make the surrounding pages. Probably a proofreader uh, responding to a bad mistake that had been made by the main copyist somewhere on those pages. But those are not the the the, the main copyist work. Those those are replacement pages. So so I won't understand what you just said. We do not have any copies of Mark 16 from the second century, third century. What we do have is Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus or Sinaiticus. That's fourth century, 300s. Now, as you showed, which of those two codices, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, had a large enough gap where you could foot verses 9 to 20 in? Uh, that's Codex Vaticanus. That's what you're looking at right here. Okay. If you, if you, scroll, up, if you scroll up there, you'll see uh, the, the page as it exists with the blank column. The only blank column anywhere in the New Testament portion, the only blank column that isn't a byproduct of, uh, byproduct of, of things that factored into the natural production of the manuscript. Uh, there we see the, the blank column, and uh, there below it is uh, the reconstruction that I made with verses 9 through 20 in that blank space. And Sam, I apologize. Uh, can you fill in for about five minutes? Sure. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, because I want to explain this. Folks, understand what he just did. Codex Vaticanus is around about 350 A.D., if, if Brother Protestant can scroll back up to that image. So this is why James Knapp is a blessing. Okay, go all the way up so we, they can see the blank space. No, okay, yeah. Uh, you got to yeah, blow it up a little bit, brother. All right. Okay, go to the top so you can see. Okay, now that's what Codex Vaticanus looks like. But you see that huge blank space? This is an actual photo of Codex Vaticanus Mark 16. So there's that huge space. What he did was he transposed... Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, showing that blank space is because verses 9 to 20 were supposed to be there. In other words, it's large enough blank space to show that the compiler, the copyist, realized verses 9 to 20 belong here. Do you see how it fits? So what you're seeing in that image is James Snap transposing what verses 9 to 20 would look in Greek and showing it fits perfectly in that blank section. So Codex Vaticanus is not a witness against the longer ending. You can actually show it is proof for the longer ending because the copyist left that blank large blank space for verses 9 to 20. Everyone getting it? Does anyone get the point? I want you to understand what's happening. And let me repeat as he gets back because this is the stuff that your notes and your Bible versions don't tell you. Approximately 1,640 copies of Mark 16, 1,337 of them. Sorry, I'm bad at math. May the Lord Jesus save me from error. 1,600, see? Approximately 1,640 copies of Mark 16 that have survived. Out of the 1,640, 1,637 of those copies have Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. Are you now, is it sinking in? Is it now making sense? Now, why is he getting technical and why is he giving you all of these graphics and he's talking about all of these codices and all of these fathers because he's dealing with the scholars who will be listening to this presentation. He is presenting the data that the scholars should know and may know and showing why they are not honestly dealing with this evidence and continue to give misinformation so that someone like you and me, I'm not a scholar of this field, for all these years I trusted Daniel Wallace, James Wine, and others. But he's now saying, look, guys, here's all the data. Here's all the reputation and arguments. When are you going to change your positions and stop misleading the people? And James White in the debate, and correct me if I'm wrong, James, and I have some questions because I want to ask questions to help them because they were somewhat confused. Did not James White in the debate say that he's actually convinced the longer end ending was included in the first century? Uh, I I wouldn't quote him on that. Uh, okay. I haven't really watched the debate, but he said it was he, – he, he granted that it was very early. Okay, early. Uh, again, guys, go hear the debate. I may have misheard him. I assume that he was even granting – it could be from the first century because of Irenaeus citing it. Now, with that said, one of the arguments he gave why he thinks it's not original and was added later on, did not James White say, 
and he says it's conjecture. This is a conjecture, his opinion. He thinks that Mark 16 ended at 8 because it was written so early on, so early on, that there was no need to write down resurrection appearances because this was a gospel tract where the evangelists would carry Mark and then they would explain the resurrection appearances, which is why, in his view, it ends at Mark 16, 8 with no resurrection appearances. What do you think of that theory? Um, it's it's an interesting theory. I would I would ask, uh, why would anybody write a book, period, if you're just going to explain everything in person? <laughs> um, so I... <laughs> I'm not, I'm not uh, there may be a, 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 a floating question about why why do people write books to explain it? books or, or so that you don't have to explain it uh, in, in Peter's case I think the gospel was Peter Peter realizes you know hey he, he's mortal and people want to hear these stories possibly after Peter's dead uh, they, they don't know when Jesus is going to come back the, the, but they, they uh they want to know about Jesus, and if you look at Acts, about what Peter says about Jesus, Peter's message in Acts clearly includes the resurrection of Jesus. So the church in Rome would, would expect to have a text that included the aspects of Peter's preaching. And of those aspects, the resurrection of Jesus would definitely be one of them. Now, with that said, let me, let me help people understand what the shorter ending and the longer ending is. Everyone knows what the longer ending is. It's Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. Here is the shorter ending that's found in some copies. Let me read it because a lot of people are like, what do you mean shorter ending, long, longer ending? This is found in the New Revised Standard Version. New Revised Standard Version, it gives you both the shorter reading and the longer reading, verses 9 to 20. Here's the short reading that's found right after verse 8 before verse 9. And all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable, pro imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Let me repeat. This is what's called the shorter ending among textual critics. Here's the shorter ending. It's found in the New Revised Standard Version. And all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Folks, that's... The shorter ending. Now, here's my question. What is the earliest attestation of that shorter ending, as far as we know? Um, I don't think there's any patristic, in, in, any clear patristic reference. I don't think there's a single patristic writer anywhere who says, I'm quoting Mark, and here's what he says at the end of his Gospels. There, there, is, there is none, as far as patristic evidence goes. As far as manuscript evidence goes, in one very strange old Latin manuscript called Codex Babiensis. It's called Babiensis because it's at the Babio uh, place. And, and, and Codex Babiensis would be around, around the year 425 or so. But that's uh, the only old Latin copy that has it. And it's the only copy of any kind that has the shorter ending that does not also have verses 9 through 20, or at least part of verses 9 to 20. Okay, so if, let, make sure I got what you said. This Codex Babiensis, around 425, this is the only copy that we have, and it's in Latin, that has a shorter ending, but also has a longer ending. Uh, no, no, Bobby Ensis does not have the longer ending. Okay, I'm sorry. Because so you said, but there is a copy that has both the shorter and longer ending. So there, there, there are there are five copies that have in the text after verse eight the shorter ending followed by the longer ending. Okay. At least when the manuscript was in pristine condition. Some of these are damaged. Okay. There's also 274 that we looked at. We, we, we've already seen about, about half the ones that have it. That's the sh shorter ending. But there's also that 274 that has verses 9 through 20 after verse 8, but in the lower margin has the shorter ending linked to the end of verse 8 by asterisk. There's an asterisk beside the end of verse 8, and there are asterisks beside the shorter ending, implying that the shorter ending was found after verse 8. Mm. So I just, again, I'm learning too with you guys. So that's why I'm asking questions so it can make it simple for all of us so I can learn. So just to repeat, the oldest known copy, which is in Latin, of the shorter ending, it's Codex Babiensis, which is dated around 425. Yes, but, but Codex Babiensis is, in, 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 is uh, also notable for, for various reasons, but one of them is it also tampers with the text of verse 8, where, where the, the part that says the woman said nothing to anyone for they were afraid, uh, the part about saying nothing to anybody was just taken out. Uh, so, so this is a this is a bold copyist. 
Wow. Also, earlier in chapter chapter 16, at verse 4, Old Latin Codex Babiensis, the, the, the same Old Latin copy, has an interpolation that says this. And I'll, I'll just read uh, uh, Metzger's uh, translation of it. But suddenly, at the third hour of the day, there was darkness over the whole circle of the earth, and angels descended from the heavens. And he, as he, the Lord, was rising in the glory of the living God, at the same time, they ascended with him, and immediately it was light. And then the woman went to the tomb. So this is all between verses 3 and verse 4 of, of Mark 16 in Codex Babiensis. So the copyist of Babiensis is being creative in some ways that most copyists would not be creative. He's uh, being kind of reckless and take, just, just taking stuff out in ways that most, most copyists would not. So uh, not only is the copyist of Babiensis in, just basically incompetent in some ways, and that may be you know, further back in the transmission line, but he's also clearly a... We, we, we can't really read his mind, but from the evidence that we do have, it looks like he was very willing to tamper with his text. Yeah. Now, just again, Harry Larry is probably not paying attention, and I don't think he's getting it. He's saying that the three oldest extent copies of Mark 16 don't have it, but one of those was Codex Vaticanus, and you demonstrated amply that there's a long enough gap showing that even the copyist was aware that verses 9 and 20 should be here, and you show that in the image that we have here. So that's really two other copies that are supposedly the oldest. But let well, me just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the point with Vaticanus isn't that it can fit there exactly. That, that really wasn't what Memorial Space was trying to do. It was just trying to convey to the reader the copyist remembered a copy that had something here that wasn't in his master copy. That's really all the Memorial Space was intended to convey. Yeah. And but that means he's aware that there is a section so, here. So... So obviously Vaticanus is not older than the scribe who made it. So if the scribe who made it is recollecting this text, then clearly Vaticanus not only points us to an exemplar that didn't have Mark 16, 9 to 20, but also to an exemplar recollected by the copyist that did have Mark 16, 9 to 20. Yeah, that's, so yeah, that's, 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 Vaticanus points both ways. Yeah. In other words, yeah, he's aware by putting this long gap, there, there are verses here he didn't include showing awareness of it. And you showed by transposing it's a long enough gap where you can actually fit the verses because you have the copy here. Yeah. yeah. You, using the methods of compression that were well known to the scribes, as we can see from the opening verses of Mark and, and, and Codex Sinaiticus, uh, this, this is enough space. Yes. Good. Now, again, I'm sorry if I'm belaboring this because I'm helping them because I can see some confusion. I don't want them com confused. I want them to know this. Guys, understand what he said about Codex Babiensis. And it's Western, right? It's a Western text? A very Western Western text. Okay, because someone asked. It's a Western text. It's not an Eastern text. It's in Latin, not in Greek. This is the oldest cop we have of that short reading ending that I read. And you said, not only is this the oldest copy, he even omitted verse 8, where it says the woman ran. Fear and part of it. Part of it. So, okay, so yeah. So you guys see Codex Babiensis is the oldest witness to this short ending. He has to then tamper with verse 8 in order then to fit it in. And this is the shorter ending. And then you said, so we can follow this line of thought. Five other copies have both the shorter ending and the longer ending with it. But now could you give us the dates of what those five copies are that have the short ending and the longer ending? Well, Co Codex L would be probably the most significant one. I think we saw Codex L earlier. And it's generally assigned on paleographical grounds, uh, in other words, by ju judging by the style of the handwriting, to be from about the 700s. 700s. 8th century, folks. That's 700s. And about the other four, do you think, approximately? Um, it's hard to date them, uh, or some of them at least, because a few of them are fragmentary, and so there's not a lot, not a lot of handwriting to work with. Yes. But you could generally say from the 600s to maybe the 800s. Okay, so that's the general frame. 600s, 800s, these five. And yet, New Testament textual scholars want to question Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, on these manuscripts, some of which are fragmentary and cannot be precisely dated, but obviously they're not before the 4th century. And on that basis, they want to question the authenticity of the longer ending. Am I correct? Uh, well, that's not their only reason. It's mainly because of Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Yes. Um, ba basically... Uh, there's a, there's a larger picture at, at work, and that is in 1881, uh, Westcott and Hort basically proposed what was called the, the theory of the Lucianic recension. 
And Hort's idea was that all your manuscripts that have the Byzantine text, in other words, 90% of your manuscripts, um, that they, they echo a text that was made by an editor in the late 200s or the early 300s, maybe, maybe Lucian, maybe somebody else, but whoever it was, they made a new edition of the text. So mm -hmm. in, from Hort's point of view, all the manuscripts that, we, that, that, that support that form of the text, which includes Mark 16, 19, 20, uh, can be dismissed out of, out of, out of, out of hand if, if they're not Alexandrian or Western. And then he would go further from there and say, well, now that we've gotten rid of 90% of the manuscripts, we just have to consider is, is a text Western or Alexandrian. He said, well, you can't rely on the Western because it's so constantly paraphrased and embellished. That leaves us with the Alexandrian text, and that leaves us with these two best representatives of the Alexandrian text, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Sinaiticus and, and, and Codex Vaticanus, and that leaves us with, uh, without verses 9 to 20 at the end of Mark. So that's the kind of reasoning that is also going on. That, that's that's the that's the kind of, kind of the, one of the large issues in which this would be a, a sub issue. Mm. But also we we had in, in a white's debate uh, some claims about Eusebius and Jerome. That's what so I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you. you. You also see this in in Metzger. Uh, this book gets quoted by commentators whenever textual questions come up, and hardly ever gets clarified uh, because Metzger states that Eusebius and Jerome attest that the passage was absent from almost all Greek copies of Mark known to them. And I think we saw this in, in, the, in the debate. Uh, it certainly looked like James White has read Bruce Metzger and absorbed some of the things that Metzger claimed. But, we, it, and, but, but you'll notice that uh, White stopped short of giving everything that Eusebius said. He got to a certain point, and then the quotation suddenly stopped, as if mm. Eusebius stopped. But Eusebius doesn't stop there. Eusebius keeps going. And I think people's impression of what Eusebius's testimony actually is changes very significantly when you look at Eusebius's whole statement in Ad Marinum, Eusebius asks, is answering a question from Marinus. Now, we don't know who Marinus is. We don't know even if Marinus is a real person or if he's just a framework created by Eusebius to answer questions that had come up to himself. But the way that the text appears to say is that uh, Matthew says that Christ arose late on the Sabbath, but Mark says early on the morning on the first day of the week. Now, how do you sort these two things out as far as, far as the timing of the resurrection? So that's the question that Eusebius is, is asking. He's not asking a, a text critical question. So the answer that, that Eusebius gives uh, is kind of kind of a by the way kind of answer when it comes to the, the, the text of Mark. But Eusebius in answer says there are two ways to resolve the apparent discrepancy. He says, in other words, it, it's a twofold solution, I think is the way he puts it. A person could say, and that's an important introduction, how he's framing this. A person could say, that the relevant passage is not found in all copies of the gospel according to Mark. And that the text in the accurate copies ends at the end of verse 8. Almost all copies of Mark end there. That is what one person might say. Notice how he frames it. Mm. That is what one person might say, rejecting the passage and rendering the question superfluous. But, and here we get to the part where you might not have seen in the debate, but, you see, continues, another view is, that both passages should be accepted. It's not the job of faithful readers to pick and choose between them. Granting that this second perspective is correct, the proper thing to do is to interpret the meaning of the passage. If we draw a distinction in the wording, we would not find it in conflict with the words in Matthew's account. We should read the words in Mark. Now, now notice how Eusebius himself describes the passage. We should read the words in Mark, rising early in the morning on the first day of the week, with a pause after rising. So that refers to Christ's resurrection. The rest, early in the morning on the first day of the week, pertains to the time of his appearance to Mary Magdalene. Now, that is not the way that a person advises a person to where, where, where the answer to the question is, oh, we just reject it. Eusebius tells Marinus, this is how you say Mark 16, 9. This is how you resolve the discrepancy, the apparent discrepancy. Why is there a reason to even give that explanation if you expect Marinus to throw the passage out? Obviously, Eusebius himself is not expecting Marinus to do that. He doesn't advise him to do that. Well, there are three things that should be noticed. First, Eusebius frames that, that as something that somebody, somebody might say. Second, Eusebius recommends retaining the passage. Third, you should see that Marinus's text already has Mark 16, 9 to 20. And fourth, Eusebius himself quotes Mark 16, 9 later in the same composition. I don't think we ever saw that pointed out in the debate. 
In one occasion, in the same composition, he states that some copies of Mark say that Jesus had cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene, and once he doesn't make any clarification about this or that copy, he just says Jesus cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene according to Mark, and that's Eusebius. Wow. It should also be pointed out when it comes to uh, how many manuscripts uh, pe people might say, well, Eusebius pictures somebody saying something about many manuscripts. This, if, if Eusebius is writing just after the persecution of Diocletian, nobody anywhere knows how many manuscripts say this or that when it comes to textual variants. Nobody, nobody's looked all over the Roman Empire to find out. So th that at most would refer to something that somebody thinks can be said about manuscripts in one particular locale or in one particular person's experience. So these things should all be taken into, into account when looking at Eusebius' testimony. But even more so is the testimony of Jerome. Time, time out for Dirkus Eider. Yeah, now even before you go to Jerome, can I just click one more time? Because remember, I wanted to sink in for them and because I was going to ask you about Jerome. So people understood what you said. Guys, you got to be paying attention. You're getting meat for free. That's why I got to pray for him and even support his ministry. Just so people understand, James White gave the impression when he didn't quote Eusebius in context that Eusebius questioned the authenticity of Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. But if James White had quoted Eusebius in its entirety, Eusebius is arguing for its veracity. It is authentic scripture, not inauthentic, and even cites it as such. Is that, do we understand you correctly? Eusebius says that th that uh, it's not in, in many manuscripts. It's Hardly in any, hardly in any manuscripts. We often don't see it. These are things that somebody could say, but Eusebius himself doesn't say that. And you would think that Eusebius, if he's you no, know, says, I, I mean, what what kind of person would say, yeah, all my accurate manuscripts and almost all my manuscripts, most most of my manuscripts and the, and the really good ones, they don't have this passage, but let's include it anyway. That that would that would be what you would. That, that that's the. That's the statement that Eusebius would be making if you go if you think that he's saying that this is what I myself have personally seen and this is what I personally affirm. When he says the statement that often gets condensed by losing this framework that Eusebius builds around it, it's often said that Eusebius says that most of his manuscripts didn't have verses nine through twenty. Well, I suspect that Eusebius there there at, at Caesarea was aware of manuscripts. That origin in the previous century had brought up from Egypt that ended at verse 8. But as far as the actual number of manuscripts that Eusebius had, when, when he's describing manuscripts himself, he only says some and doesn't get any more specific than that as far as the proportion is concerned. Hmm. Now, going to J Jerome, because this was brought up, Eusebius and Jerome, what was Jerome's view about the longer ending, Brother James? Well, if you look at the at the Vulgate, which Jerome translated into Latin in the year 383, Jerome included Mark 16, 9 through 20. The, the copies that the other, other copies of the Vulgate are not it doesn't doesn't leave any doubt about this. And mm -hmm. Jerome and elsewhere in his letters to, to to Marcellus and also in his introduction to the Vulgate, he states that he based the gospel's text upon ancient Greek manuscripts. Now, those aren't just ancient to us. Those are ancient to Jerome in 383. So you can imagine how ancient they would have to be. Uh, at least more ancient than Jerome. So in in, in Jerome's composition called Ad, Ad Hedibium, uh, he starts to answer questions about the same thing that Eusebius was answering questions about. Hedibia asked, what about the uh, differences in the Gospels when it comes to the post-resurrection events? And Jerome suddenly begins writing along the same lines as Eusebius. In fact, he breaks down Hedibia's larger question into several smaller questions, and they're the same questions that, that Marinus asked, asked Eusebius a hundred years earlier than this. What's happening here is Eusebius is simply recycling, excuse me, back that up. What's happening here is Jerome is simply recycling what Eusebius had written in Greek, and he's rephrasing it in Latin. He's condensing it here, he's He's adjusting a phrase there. But what we see in that part of Ad Hedibium is Jerome reusing Eusebius. So we do, it's not like this is Jerome's personal observation. Both the questions and the answers are both from Eusebius. What we see, what we see in Ad Hedibium, not only the answers, but the questions, and three of the same questions in the same order are shared with Eusebius' composition. So uh, David uh, Parker uh, in, in Britain uh, put, put, put it this way. He said, Jerome's letter to Hedibia 
is simply a translation with some slight changes of what Eusebius had written. It is thus worthless for our purposes. And Parker concluded, Jerome is no evidence for the short ending. Mm. So, but what's happening here is Jerome is doing what he was known to do. He's borrowing from, from another writer. When you look at some of the commentaries of Jerome, you're often not reading Jerome. You're reading somebody earlier than, than Jerome. But Jerome openly acknowledged in Epistle 75, yeah, sometimes I do that. Sometimes when I'm in a hurry, I'll just pick up a book from, that somebody older wrote, wrote, and I'll dictate to my secretary what I have borrowed from other writers. People who are oblivious to that or people who ignore that think that we have in Jerome, Jerome saying that he had seen, and sometimes commentators uh, misrepresent Jerome in, in this way, saying that Jerome also must have seen, or that Jerome did see himself the, what, what, what Eusebius had, had said that could be said about many manuscripts. Those commentators are missing two important facts of the case. First, that Jerome is simply re repeating what, what Eusebius had written, and also that Eusebius, when, when in the details of what he wrote, of course, Jer Jerome paraphrases the condenses here and there, but Eusebius said, this is what somebody could say, and he himself instructs Marinus on how to, how to speak the words of Mark 169, which is not the way to reject a passage. So those are, those are two important aspects to the testimony of Eusebius and the testimony of Jerome that we did not see from Dr. White in the debate. Mm. Also, in the year 417 and against the Pelagians, Jerome pictures a champion of orthodoxy explaining where he had seen the passage that's called the Phrylogion. And in the course of mentioning the Phrylogion, or what we know today as the Phrylogion, he quoted from Mark 16 and 14 to show where it had been found and he doesn't point out to his readers anything like, oh, by the way, in, in some of your copies, you might find Mark 16, 14, and then find this other thing. He, he quotes Mark 16, 14, like, that's the expected text, and this other reading is, is, is the unusual thing. And he says that he found it, especially in Greek codices. So the question comes up, how does Jerome say to Hadibium, oh, we, we, we hardly ever find verses 9 to 20 in Greek codices, and then say in Against the Plagians, I find this variant, especially in Greek codes. Well, the explanation is when he's writing at Hedibium, he's not writing about his own experience or his, his own collection of manuscripts. He's writing about things that Eusebius had written and simply condensing what Eusebius had said. And he mentions the Greek codices because Eusebius is writing in Greek and he's writing in Latin. It's really not that hard to see. Hmm. Now, again, I'm going to walk this point by point. Remember, because we're learning. We're neophytes. We thank God for you. So just so people understand, the citation of Jerome that James White referred to, it wasn't Jerome, it was Eusebius that Jerome was quoting. Did I get to get it right? That's exactly right. Yeah, Eusebius is writing to Marinus in the early 300s. Mm. Jerome was writing to Hadibia in the early 400s. But Jerome is a busy guy. He's retired. He's got a lot to do. He often writes... By, by by dictation, and the secretary writes it down. Mm. He says in Epistle 75, yes, sometimes when I want to settle a superfluous question, I'll just pick up a book and read it out and send off that letter. That's mm. what we see here when he's writing to Hedibia. Hedibia has this broad question. How do you reconcile the differences at the end of the Gospels? Well, if somebody asked you that, Sam, would, would you take the time to just, well, I, this person asked me this casual question to, to get to the bottom of it. No. It, it would take days for a response if you're going to write something spontaneous. I, I would give them your link, your article. So, so Jerome, instead of making a spontaneous composition of how to resolve the harmonization difficulties at the ends of the Gospels, he says, hey, you know, I know somebody that's already done this, and there you go. And that's really all there is to it. And you can look at the letters that Marinus asked and the letters that are presented by Jerome in his letter to Dehadibium and see the same, essentially the same questions in the same order. So there shouldn't be any question about what's going on there. It's an echo. It's Eusebius times two. So secondly, what Jerome does quote Mark 16, 14 authoritatively. He doesn't say, oh, by the way, this passage, what we know as Mark 16, 14, is questionable. He quotes it as being genuine and what Mark wrote when he quotes it. Well, well Jerome had already made the Vulgate translation so he would expect you know, th those that had his Vulgate in their hands to, to have Mark 16, 9 to 20. But, but in, uh, against the Pelagians, when he's saying where he found the, the passage called the Phrylogion, 
Uh, he quotes Mark 16, 14 as, as the reference. In other words, he doesn't think Mark 16, 14 is floating around here and there. He quotes it with the expectation that if he quotes the free login as the, the, the ship that's that's docked here, Mark 16, 14 is the dock. It's mm. not you know, something wandering around. Mm. So basically, uh, Jerome is support for the longer ending, not against it, like David Parker, another textual critic, said. He's not... He's not evidence for the shorter re re reading. He's actually evidence for the longer reading. Jerome is evidence for the longer reading, not only by including it in the Vulgate, but also by referencing Mark 16, 14 as where he found the Philologion in some Greek copies. Mm. And uh, and those that would that would use Jerome as evidence for for the for the ending at verse eight are simply quoting a repetition of what. Eusebius had written, even though we know that Jerome explicitly says in his epistle 75, you know, I often, you know, when I'm in a hurry, I will use somebody else's material. That's what he's doing here. He's using somebody else's material. That's that's really the whole story. Okay. So, guys, pay attention. So, Irenaeus, 180, a disciple of Polycarp, disciple of John. Eusebius, Jerome, some of the greatest church fathers, historians, scholars, apologists. These three giants of the early church were all in favor, support of the longer reading, right? Am I wrong or am I, did I get it? Uh, you, you, you're correct. Uh, I think I listed over 32 patristic references, not just Irenaeus, but you could you say Irenaeus, Tatian. I'm very confident that Justin's Tatian. reference to, 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 to Mark 1620 is, is there's no reason, to, no, no reason to doubt it unless the person is trying to find reasons to doubt it. In, in other words, if, if you're going to say, well, we, we won't help Justin, uh, you better do a lot of combing over your apparatus because a lot of things are like that, where, where you have to actually think about the reference. It's not, it's not as explicit as a, I found this in this book and this chapter. But, but also uh, Augustine, full of quotations. Oh, yeah, Augustine, all, all over. Yeah, Augustine yeah, in, his, in his Harmony of the Gospels. Uh, Augustine, on, on one occasion, uh, Augustine, when he refers to how he reads the books of heretics, he makes an analogy and says, when I read the books of heretics and I keep those books in my library, it's like a fulfillment of the prophecy that you can pick up snakes and not be harmed by them because he's picking up the heretical books and not being harmed oh, yeah. by them. That's the idea. And, but, but also he quotes his Greek manuscripts. So Augustine's writing in Latin in, in North, North Africa. But Augustine quotes from his Greek manuscripts. In his Greek manuscripts, he quotes Mark 16, 12, specifically in Greek, even though Augustine himself is a Latin writer. Also, St. Ambrose. Full of, full of references to, to Mark 16, 19, 20. He quotes it repeatedly, including in one reference where he says, we have heard that passage written, where he's qu quoting from, from, from Mark 16, 19, 20. So that shows that not only did, did Ambrose have it, but it was being read in his churches, and he was quoting it in the course of his homily, which, which became his writing. So again, brother, I'm blown away, and they're getting blown away, so I'm going to repeat it for them to see. It's not only Irenaeus, guys, Eusebius, or Jerome, Augustine, Augustine, Ambrose, and you said Justin Martyr and his pupil Tashian. Now, let me explain who Tashian is for everyone here because you have a lot of Assyrians. I'm Assyrian. For the Assyrians, Tashian was one of our spiritual and ethnic forefathers. Tashian was an Assyrian, Ashuraya, disciple of Justin Martyr, who translated the four Gospels as one harmony, the four Gospels into one, the diatessaron around 170, and he included it in his Syriac <clears throat> harmonization of the four Gospels, one of our Assyrian ancestors, Christians, in the diatessaron. So Irenaeus, oh. Justin Martyr, Tashian, Eusebius, Jerome, Augustine, Ambrose, and that's just some of the 32. I, I don't want you to run out of fingers, but also Ephraim. Ephraim, the, the Syrian. Wow. Okay, so then with that said, and, and, and Epiphanius on, on Cyprus. Epiphanius against all here. Guys, what else do you want to be convinced this is authentic scripture? So with that said, I want to read these two notes. And basically these are the questions because most of the people were wanting, wanting to understand because it was really deep and they appreciate it, but they wanted to understand. So I think these questions help clarify things for folks. But here's what I want to do. Good, brother. Oh, Good. Oh, and don't forget, while, while Ephraim had it there, there where he was, Meanwhile, no, fast forward 100 years, Patrick's got it over in Ireland, too. So, 
in you Ireland, they got it. You can't, you can't stretch your arms far enough. Yes, Pat, Patrick's Only using, in Ireland. Yes, <laughs> you, and he's not using the Vulgate. He's got an old Latin text over there. So it's not the Vulgate. So it must be some other version, and it made it all the way to Ireland. Okay. So now, then help me understand this. And honestly, I'm telling this, and I and I bear witness before the Lord. Until I found you. I really had great doubts about Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, and John 7, 53, 8, 11, because I'm not a scholar of textual criticism, and this is not my field, and I don't have the time to study it and become an expert. But this is where Jesus shows, folks, this is where Jesus shows he's almighty, sovereign, and alive, and he loves his church, and he will raise up these voices. James Snap in this generation, in a bygone generation, it was John Bergon. Now, when I read these notes... These are the notes I read. Let me just show you what I read in my NIV and ESV. Guys, I'm going to read these two notes for our brother, and I want you to tell me what do you think of these notes because we are we don't know. We trust these Bible translators and the notes they provide. So in my NIV, right before verse 9, in brackets it says, the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 to 20, and then the ESV in brackets some of the earliest manuscripts do not include 16 verses 9 to 20. Now, I read that. These are evangelical Trinitarian translators. Are they wrong? If so, why would they mislead me this way? They're technically, technically, they're correct, but they're leaving out so much of the picture. It's like having this huge picture of testimony from the patristic writings, from the lectionaries, from the early versions, and just zeroing in on two manuscripts and letting the reader not be told about the rest of it. When you say, I mean, I can truthfully tell you, some manuscripts have Mark 16, 19, 20, and some manuscripts don't. Well, that's true. But, uh, I think I need to go into a door. That, 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 that's true, but that first sum, I'm referring to three manuscripts. That second sum, I'm referring to 1,640. <laughs> so, so it's technically true, but tends to mislead in terms of what's the practical effect of these footnotes. The footnotes should at least include some reference to the patristic writers like Irenaeus. We see we have a precedent for that in manuscript 1582. So I don't know why the footnote writers are, seem, seem hesitant unless they don't think that their approach could really stand to the public scrutiny that it would if people took a closer look at the actual evidence. Wow. Wow. Amazing stuff. Folks, let me again remind you he has a YouTube channel. James Knapp, and he's now doing a series on textual criticism. The last session he did was on Mark 16, verse 9 to 20. Go to his YouTube channel. We're going to put it in the description box. Also, you have a blog. What's the name of the blog? And we're going to put the link in the description box. What's the name of your blog? TheTextOfTheGospels.com. And I right. also have a, the, the, the text of the gospels .com. I also have a book that's specifically about this textual variant uh, called uh, Authentic, The Case for Mark 16, 9 to 20. Uh, it's 99 cents on Amazon, but you can also get it free from me on request. Okay, so you can find them on the text of the gospels.com. We have the link on his YouTube channel and on Facebook, and he's available to speak at your churches when COVID allows him to, or for your YouTube sessions. He's done sessions for me, he's done sessions for Al Fadi, Sira, C I R A International, he's done sessions with Jay Dyer. He's done sessions with William Albrecht and Reason and Theology, and I want you guys to pray for him. Go and get his resources, subscribe to his YouTube channel, and invite him. We need him to speak more about these issues because he is balancing out the misinformation. And pray God continue to support him. He's been a blessing to me, and I thank the Lord for him. And I'm going to have you back again to talk about some of the arguments against, again, one more time, John 7, 53, 8, 11. But brother... So much. Those were the questions that I think were most beneficial to help them understand. And now they understood. Let me just end it with this. And you can, final words. 1,640 copies of Mark 16 extent. 1,637 of them have the longer ending. And Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, Tashian, Ephraim, <clears throat> Eusebius, Jerome, Augustine, Ambrose, and someone in Ireland all quote the longer ending of Mark 16, verse 9 to 20, as thus saith the Lord, and yet people still want to doubt it. So any final words from you, and then we'll call it the wrap. Yes, we, we didn't cover the internal evidence very much, but I would point out a, a quote from uh, John Bergen. We mentioned him before. Uh, Bergen pointed out the, the question is not 
at all one of authorship, but only of genuineness. The question is, was this in the master copy? Was this in the text when it began to be circulated for church use? So the question of, is this a composite book? Bergen, from, from the get-go, said that's not the question. The question is, does this belong in the text? Was it initially there, or was it taken out? And I think when you look at how it was received, in every way, if you look at the testimony of the church, everywhere except in, in Egypt, because Eusebius' manuscripts, you know, so some of them came from Egypt, we, we see uh, enormous support, not only in the 99% of the manuscripts, but also the patristic writers who represent locales from Ireland to Armenia, from Africa to Italy, to Asia Minor, to Palestine, Israel, uh, and some from, from, from Egypt too. So uh, when you look at the, the scope of the reading, it's not just that there are a lot of a lot of fruit on one branch. The fruit is all over, and that should tell us something about what we should do with this passage. I would, I would say that tells us we should keep it. Hallelujah. We found it in the text of Mark. Hallelujah. Praise God for this brother. Pray for him. I will bring him on to go more in depth on these issues. He's already done a session on the evidence for Mark 16 here and other channels. Again, support him. Pray for him. Invite him. We need to give him more platforms. And again, I'm going to repeat. James White was asked, straight up, you can go explain apologetics, the session he did with Stephen Boyce. He was asked, will you debate James Snap? And he tap danced around the issue and said he wants to debate James Snap on a sot soteriological issue, John 6. No, that's not what you're asked, James. Will you or Stephen Boyce or Daniel Wallace debate this man on Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, and John 7, 53 to 8, 11. So far, they're making excuses to duck him. But glory to Jesus, that just tells you, if they're ducking him, they don't want to debate him, they're afraid of his facts because they can't refute the facts. Glory to Jesus. May the Lord preserve him and us for his glory. Guys, 9.30 p.m. It's right now. You know, 9.30 p.m. I'm going live after this. 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm going live to talk about the fall of Satan and some issues with Bible version. So, Lord willing, I'll see you back in about, what, two hours, I guess, an hour and a half? 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm live. Invite people, and thank you for showing up, and thank you, James Knapp, and thank you, Protestant Believer. You're a gift to the body of Christ. We love you. Thanks, Thanks for having me on, Sam. I appreciate it. I'm going to bring you more in Jesus' name.